All right, take your Bible with me this morning. We're in a series of messages called Gifted, and I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Let me just ask a real quick question. How many of you were here last weekend? Can I see your hand real quick? Awesome. Great. How many of you were not here last week? It's okay. Don't be ashamed. It's all right. We're not going to put any shame on you. All right. Very good. How many of you who were here last weekend uh, did your homework assignment? Can I see your hand real quick? <clears throat> uh-huh. So you get an A. You get the rest of it. Shame, shame, shame. <clears throat> we're going to give an A to the rest of you, and uh, that A plus $2 will get you coffee in some places, <laughs> but not at Starbucks. So anyway. All right, uh, just so glad you're here. So here's the thing. We gave you a homework assignment last week, and we're talking about gifted, and we're looking at the 12, excuse me, 12. (laughs) If there's 12, I'm really. We're looking at the seven gifts in Romans 12, all right? We're looking at the seven gifts are in Romans 12. Here's my belief. I believe that every human being is born with one of those seven, every human being. And uh, here's the thing. You don't have to be saved to get one of those. You just have to be a human. (laughs) So uh, every human has a gift. But what God's wanting you to do is to recognize that is a unique gifting within you. Uh, so in, in our family, it's just funny. Uh, if this was a genetic thing, uh, wouldn't one of my kids have the same gifting as me or my wife? Just had this thought this morning. I mean, I had, didn't even have it yesterday. Just had this thought. My kids are totally different than mom and dad in this gifting area. So I just, I, well, here's what I want you to know. Here's why. Because we have an, a heavenly father who has unique gifts. He has, he's the only person who has all seven. And therefore, he is, he, is dep- he is imparting those gifts to human beings, to humanity. That's pretty cool to think about. So we'll, we're going to talk more about that next week. So here's what I want to do this week, just as a quick reminder about these seven gifts. And remember, I, well, I did something last week called what I'm calling the rule of sevens. There is this seven that's in the Bible that every time you'll see list of seven, and seven's the number of completion. And so, uh, but it's interesting that everything that falls in list number one, in, in, on the first part of the list, number one on the, the list of seven, matches up with every other number one in the list of sevens. And so that's what we're kind of looking at. And so there's a list of seven gifts, and we're going back and we're looking at other things. So last week, the homework assignment was to look at Genesis and to look at Ephesians chapter 6, Genesis 1, Ephesians 6, and then Revelation 2 and 3. And we're looking at the seven days of creation, the seven items in the armor of God, and we're looking at the seven churches. And then uh, occasionally I'm just throwing in another list of seven, which is the furniture that was in the, uh, was in the tabernacle. There are seven items or seven pieces of furniture that are in the tabernacle. So occasionally... If I remember, I'm bringing something to that, all right? So let me just show you some things today. So we're looking at Romans 12. Let me read real quick. Uh, If you're in your Bible, stay at Revelation 2, because I'm only going to read about two verses here, and then we're going to move over to Revelation 2. So uh, in uh, Romans 12, verse 6, it says this, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If it's prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving... He, or he who teaches in his teaching. And those are the three that we talked about last week. So if you miss that, you'll need to go back and grab the podcast and listen to it. And then next week, we're going to come back and we're going to kind of sum all of them up. So this week, we're going to talk about these, verse 8. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, who, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness all right so i almost as i started this list this week i almost went back and said okay one two three last week and then one two three four this week but to keep it in line with the list of sevens i'm starting with number four this week does that make sense so here's number four the fourth gift in this list is encourager encourager and so there are people who are gifted encouragers. Have you ever met someone who just, you know, you're just around them for five or ten seconds and you just feel encouraged when you're around them? They have a gift of encouragement. So how does that uh, line up with creation? So we're talking about day four of creation. What happened on day four of creation? So here's what God did on day four. He, he gave stars, he gave the moon, and he gave the sun. Now here's a, a, an important distinction It's not that he gave light on day four because day one he gave light, okay? Now he's giving a source of light on day four. So he's giving stars, he's giving moon, and he's giving the sun. 
And so why did he give them? What does the Bible say was the purpose in him giving them? Well, the Bible says that they were there to mark out days and months and years and seasons. That's why he gave them to us. Okay, okay let me just ask a question. Does the sun mark out days? Yes. Does the moon mark out a 28-day cycle? Yes. Uh, uh, are the, do the stars help us to recognize uh, seasons? And if you don't understand the stars, you need to know the stars in the heavens, they're really not moving, but we're going to say for this case that they're moving. Well, the earth's in an orbit, and so therefore it appears that the stars are moving, but they mark out as the different constellations appear in the sky, different seasons, different times. Okay, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's a cycle. It's a constant cycle that's going on. And here's what God says specifically. You can go and read it. Genesis 1 says, if you did your homework, you read this. <laughs> so uh, that, if, that they were given to govern over time. That's a specific translation of that. He says they're given to govern over time. Let me say something about an encourager. An encourager is someone who actually governs over time. But by the way, uh, a, a, an encourager is not a natural born leader, but over time they actually help leaders to govern. Okay, let, let, me, let me explain that a little bit, okay? Uh, let, me, let me go from the converse of it, okay? Uh, do you think a person who is discouraging will help leaders to change their policies? Well, maybe. <clears throat> but not in a positive way. <laughs> is that right? Okay, let's, here's what an encourager does. Uh, let me just say, I'm gonna, I just want you to know, people who encourage me help me to make, actually make decisions that actually bless their life. Because a go, a, an encourager governs over time. Uh, and over time, I know if you're an encourager or a discourager. Does, does that make sense? So this is what an encourager does. Uh, by the way, every one of these gifts has pros and cons or strengths and weaknesses. One of the weaknesses of an encourager is that encouragers typically are people pleasers. Okay, now let me tell you, someone says, well, what's wrong with that? Because when you're a people pleaser, you don't have room to be a God pleaser in your life. And so I'm just saying one of the, I'm talking about a weakness is, if you're not careful, you'll begin to encourage people out of a heart to please them rather than out of a heart to please God. And there's a big difference there. Does that make sense? Uh, anyone ever met a people pleaser? <clears throat> don't point to your neighbor, you know. But you understand, that's what an encourager does. Uh, let me say something else. Let me tell you one of the problems with that. So here's another uh, weakness of that. If you're a people pleaser, oftentimes what happens is uh, you get to the place where you so want to please them and you think you're doing it out of a heart of encouragement that oftentimes people pleasers get influenced by the wrong people. And, and, they're very, and encouragers are susceptible to bad leaders. I want you to hear me about this, okay? Let me, say it, let me say it in stronger language, all right? They are susceptible to evil leaders. Okay, let me say it even stronger, all right? Uh, they are susceptible to demonic influence. I want you to hear that about it. I mean, by the way, nothing wrong with an encourager. Don't hear me say it's bad to be an encourager. I'm just saying to you, you need to be careful that if you don't keep your eyes on the Lord, you can actually be led astray as an encourager. Uh, so let me, let me just, it's interesting. What's the armor of God? that lines up, when we're talking about Ephesians 6, what's the armor that's number four in the list? Okay, let me get, get this. This is pretty interesting. We're talking about a people pleaser and someone has the potential of being led astray. Okay, here's the piece of armor that's in the armor of God. Uh, watch this. You, and take up the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. Okay, listen to me. If you're an encourager, your number one thing you need to do is make sure you put on your shield every single day. Because Satan, you got, I hope you hear this, Satan is throwing darts at you that are on fire and they're trying to pop your balloon of encouragement. Okay, let me say something else. Think about Romans 12. Romans 12 says if it's, a, if, if it's an exhortation, if it's exhorting, then exhortation is the redemptive side of that. So if exhorting, then exhort. Okay, here's what I, I hope you're catching about this. Let me say something about an encourager. Oftentimes, encouragers are encouragers on the outside, but on the inside, they feel like whitewashed tombs. Let me say it a different way. They are depressed. <laughs> They're discouraged. They, they, have, uh, they have the potential of having big mood swings. And yet, at the same time, on the outside, we all think that everything's going great in their life because they're such an encourager. 
I mean, they can't help themselves. They'll encourage, but on the inside, they feel, they feel discouraged. Okay? So watch this. Again, here's the key to that, keeping your eyes on the Lord, following after him, uh, putting on the shield of faith so Satan doesn't pop your balloon all the time. Uh, so let, let me read Revelation. Here's the fourth church of the book of Revelation. All right, so I want you to read it with me. Revelation 2, look down to verse 18. Watch this. This is the church that lines up with this. And by the way, I realize there is more uh, things that I could talk about in Revelation. If I was on a subject of end times, I would talk about it from that sense. But we're talking about it from the sense of a list of seven, okay? So here's what happens in, verse, uh, the, fourth, in the fourth church. Verse 18, And to the church of, uh, in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. Okay, I just want to bring something out. Remember, number, day four is about the sun, the moon, and the stars. Remember that? And then what, what's item four that's in the tabernacle? The golden lampstand with flaming fire on top of it. And this verse says, Jesus, who has eyes like fire. What's fire do? By the way, let me say something about light. Light's an encouraging source. Let me prove that to you. Have you ever gone, uh, uh, you know, this will probably only apply to one family in our whole church, but, you know, ever lived in Spokane, Washington, where there's no sun ever. <clears throat> and then one day the sun pops out, right? Okay, I, think about this. Have you ever been through a time frame where it rained in Texas for days on end? I know it's such a rare thing for us, but just it rain, 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 and clouds and no sun, and then one day the sun pops out. How does it feel when the sun pops out? Don't you feel encouraged when the sun pops out? There's something about light that encourages. One of my favorite shows on television right now is called The Last Alaskan. Anyone seen it? All right, I love that show. I love survival stuff. But, so watch this. I was watching an episode. They're talking about that uh, for several months out of the year, they only have four hours of light a day. In one episode, they were showing it at 11 a.m., and it was pitch black. And they were talking about the depression and the discouragement that sets in during that time frame. Okay, listen, let me tell you what light does. Light brings encouragement. And here's what this verse says. Jesus has eyes a flame of fire. Okay, I hope you're catching this. Jesus has the gift of encouragement because he's the light of the world. Is that, is that good? Okay, so watch this. He, goes, he says, I know your deeds, and I know your love, and faith, and service, and perseverance, and that your deeds are of late are greater than at first. But I have something against you. Remember I said every, every one of them have a weakness. I have something against you. That you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. And she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality. And they eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent. And she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I'll throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the church will know that I am, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. Notice he's looking on the inside. You might sow something on the outside, but he's seeing something that's on the inside. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest are in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them. I place no other burden on you. So I just want to pause real quick and talk about Jezebel just briefly. Jezebel uh, was a, uh, uh, some, some, uh, she was a woman who ruled over Israel with an iron fist. She was an evil ruler over Israel. Let me say it some, a, a, a different way. She was a witch. She practiced witchcraft. Now, here's what you need to catch. Here's, here was her big deception as a witch. She was rebellious. Now, the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Okay, here's what I want you to catch real quick. So an encourager will actually try and encourage this poor leader, this bad leader, this rebellious leader, and they'll get sucked into the trap, and the next thing they know, they're following the wrong person. Yeah, by the way, you shouldn't be scared as an encourager. You just need to be on guard. That Satan has some ploys to try and get your attention and to get you to follow wrong leadership, rebellious leadership. You find someone who's rebellious, don't encourage them, rebuke them. So you see the difference? Okay, so, uh, but let me, let me show you again, because we're just showing how it matches up. Fours match up. Nevertheless, verse 25 says, what have I told you? Hold fast until I come. In other words, Keep doing the right things. Keep encouraging the right people. Verse 26, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. Now, here's what I want you to catch about that. He says, if you'll just keep on and keep on over time, I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to give you authority over nations. Remember what the sun and the moon and the stars are there for? 
to govern over time. So in other words, keep on. It may not seem like you're doing the right things, but keep on keeping on, and eventually you're going to rule over the nations. And, and, verse 27 says, and he shall rule them. And it's not talking about Jesus. He is not, it's, he's talking about the encourager. He's talking about the person who's involved in this church. He shall rule with them with a rod of iron. And the vessels of the potter are broken into pieces, as I have also given authority from my father. Watch verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. Okay, I hope you caught that. By the way, what's the morning star? Morning star we would refer to as the north star. You know what the north star is there for? Because in the middle of the night when a sailor is crossing the sea and they don't know where to go, they'll look for the north star so they can get their bearings and get straight. And it's a great encouragement when you know where you're going. And isn't it interesting that he's given the morning star and Genesis is the stars that he gave and the sun and the moon. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? And he says this, and I think it's really telling you there's a big truth that's hidden here. Let him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is that pretty cool? Okay, so that's an encourager. What's a steward now? So he says, he who gives, let him give with liberality or uh, with generosity. And I'll, and I'll explain why generosity is the redemptive side of stewardship. And there are just some people who are just naturally born stewards all right i actually live with a steward in my home i won't tell you which one but you'll figure it out okay it won't take you long okay i have a steward that's in my home so uh watch this uh what happened on day five of creation we're going to match it up with the fifth thing so fish and birds were given on day five and here's what's really cool about it this is the first time that this statement is made remember we're doing this in regard to a giver a steward all right giving okay Here's what Jesus says about the fish and the birds. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Do you know what a steward does? You know what a giver does? He's faithful and he becomes fruitful and what is given multiplies. Okay, isn't that how giving works? God says, I'll bless what you give. Okay, do you understand that? I mean, isn't that cool that that... That must be just an accident that was written, that giving and stewardship go, and, and multiplication all go hand in hand. Don't you think? You think it's an accident? Or do you think God placed it there on purpose? Now, uh, what, what, when you, okay, I, I'm going to bring out a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting. Think about this. There are people, when you, when you, as soon as you start talking about giving, there's a whole group of people that are so caught up in the grace movement that they will make this statement as soon as you start talking about giving. Well, I don't believe in that because giving and tithing are an Old Testament principle, and we don't live under the, the Old Testament. We are a New Testament. We live under grace, not the law. Okay, I just want to bring out a point so that you catch this, okay? So that you, you know, I want you to hear me because if you don't understand this, you will totally miss stewardship, okay? I want you to hear this. What number gift is this? It's the fifth gift. Do you know what the number five is? You, I hope you catch this. You know what, every number has a meaning to it. You know what the number five represents? Grace. Okay, listen to me. Giving is not a law issue. It's a grace issue. It is. And I, I hope you, listen, you'll never understand grace if you don't understand this. Okay, listen to me. If, if God did not so love the whole world that he would give, we would never have grace. So I'm telling you, giving and grace go hand in hand. Get out of this idea that tithing's an Old Testament principle. It's a New Testament principle. Now, just think with me. Again, go back to day five for just a second. What was God actually saying to the birds and the fish when he said, be fruitful and multiply? Okay, what was he saying? Okay, he was saying, reproduce. Okay, I'm just giving you a chance to go, yeah, that's right, preacher, that's right. Isn't that right? Okay, let me tell you what a steward does. A steward, a redeemed steward, not only stewards what he has, but a redeemed steward helps others to reproduce stewardship in their life. Do you think stewardship might be important in the body of Christ? Okay, so I, I want you to catch that. So important you understand, stewards help us to be become better stewards. Uh, when I see a giver, I'm, by the way, I am not naturally gifted in the area of stewardship. But when I see other people who are givers, it challenges me. I think to myself, wow, if they can give that way, I want to give that way. 
I, I see how they give, I, and I see how God blesses them. By the way, here's what's interesting. You don't have to have the gift of stewardship for God to bless your life. All you have to do is practice the, practice the principles of stewardship. Y'all, do y'all understand that? Okay, so it's an incredible thing, that, and they reproduce. So uh, let me say a, a, a weakness, a con, a weakness. A weakness of a steward is they typically get stuck in the slow and steady. Uh, here's the problem with being, nothing wrong with being slow and steady, nothing wrong with that, but sometimes stewards have a difficulty in pushing out in faith. Let's hold off until. And so they begin to lose faith. They begin to get to the place where they don't want to trust the Lord. Okay, what is the item, this is interesting, what is the item in the armor of God that lines up with this? What's the fifth item in the armor of God? The helmet of salvation. Now you say, why the helmet of salvation? Just again, think about this. If God had not given his son, we would not get grace nor salvation. And so I'm telling you, giving goes hand in hand with seeing people saved. Okay, let, let me put it a different way so you can get this, okay? Because I hope we have a lot of givers in our church. You may not have the gift of giving, but we have a lot of givers in our church. We have a lot of tithers in our church. We're blessed. Let me tell you what that does so that you understand this. It gives us the opportunity to actually win more people to Jesus. That's the best thing that we could ever do. Uh, let, me, let me say something about uh, Freedom Fest that's coming up. You know what we're going to do with Freedom Fest? It's an opportunity for us to give the good news to, to other people. Now, we don't, we don't know if they'll accept it or not, but we, our job is not to get to win people to Jesus. Our job is to tell people about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's the one who saves them, not us. Does that make sense? We're just a steward of what God has given us. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, so uh, look, look, watch this. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. This is the fifth church, and this is the church, he says, to the angel of the church in Sardis. Right, let me say something about Sardis real quick. Sardis was one of the wealthiest towns in that day and time, Sardis was one of the wealthiest time, towns of, of, its, of its region. The reason why was it was a, on the major trade route. And there was a lot of income that was coming in. And God was blessing that community with a lot of wealth. With a lot of wealth. Uh, another uh, name for Sardis was it was also known as the city of white. Uh, you could see Sardis from a long way coming because uh, the, the city officials wanted you to, they wanted to flaunt their wealth. And they wanted everyone to believe how wealthy they were when they would come in, that they, was just a, they were coming to a rich community. So they would whitewash every building, every house in the entire community. It was a mandate that everything had to be white in the community so that it even looked rich when you showed up. Okay? Uh, and so I just want you to see, again, uh, that can, looking rich. By the way, let me tell you what uh, can typically happen to a steward is uh, you can be a good steward and become greedy. I hope you heard that. You can be a good, you can have a gift of stewardship, never have it redeemed, and be a greedy person. That's why the Bible says, learn to do it with generosity and liberality. Are y'all following that? Okay. So they had a problem in Sardis, and that was they were holding up, they were hoarding what they had been given. So he says, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. He says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain. By the way, that is a steward. You know what a steward does? A steward takes the little bit that remains and strengthens it, and it becomes more. So that's what he says. Wake up, strengthen the little things that you do have that remain, which were, they were about to die. And by the way, that's what a steward does. He take, you can, uh, a good steward can take your little small resources and help them to multiply. And sometimes it feels like you're about to die when you don't have a few resources, right? He says, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received, because they were getting a lot, and heard, and keep it. Don't forget where this all came from. Don't forget who the giver of everything is. And, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief. By the way, this is one of the things that a steward is most scared of, is that they're going to lose everything. I'm going to come like a thief. And uh, he says... Uh, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, here's what, say, what's the answer? What does a steward need to do? A steward needs to not walk in, uh, say, a lot of times a steward, they're, they're satisfied with their wealth, and they think their wealth is what's keeping them. And what God says is, stop looking at your wealth, start walking with me. In other words, you need to listen to me. You need to do it like I would do. 
Jesus was the greatest steward who ever lived, but he was the most generous man who ever lived too. We, we, I hope you catch that balance there. So he says, uh, for they are worthy. Verse 5 says, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's what a steward is, all right? So let's move to 6, leader. Number 6, what happened on day 6? God created animals and humans on day 6 in creation. And here's what he said to the humans. He said, fill the earth and reign over it. Does that sound like a leader if they're to reign over it? Another version says this, take dominion over it. Is that what a leader does? Yes. Okay, what is the armor of God that lines up with a leader? Okay, think about this. What's the armor of God that leans up with a leader? Okay, this is item number six in the armor of God. And he says, and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. Okay, this is a leader's tool. A sword is a leader's tool. Okay, here's what a leader does. Okay, watch this. A leader takes his sword and he lifts it up and says, charge. Okay, is that leadership? Yes. I, I hope you're seeing this, that these things line up. And here's what he says to man, take dominion. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. Rule the earth. This is leadership, okay? And, and the number six is the representative of man. The number six itself is the representative of man. So here's what a leader does. A, a leader organizes. A leader brings structure. But here's a weakness of a leader. A leader tends to bounce around. So here's what a leader will do. Oftentimes, again, this is the weakness of a leader. A leader will come over here, and he'll get this group all fired up, and come on, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. Come on, charge. And this whole group says, yeah, let's charge. And they run into battle. And while they're running into battle, he thinks to himself, you know, that was pretty good. I got them going. Let me see if I can get this group going over here. And he'll run over here, and he'll say, you know, I'll tell you. And he'll fire up this group. And he gets excited about this group. And he says, all right, y'all ready to go? Yeah, come on, let's go. Charge. And the whole group says, charge. And he run out, and he bounces around a little bit. This is, by the way, it is a weakness. You'll find pastors sometimes who are leaders naturally, but they, they'll get bored with leading one little thing, and so they'll bounce around, and you'll find pastors that move from church to church to church to church. They're great leaders, but they have a ten tendency to bounce around. By the way, you don't have to be a pastor to be a leader. You can be a leader in the community, but leaders sometimes bounce from project to project to project, job to job to job, because they get bored easily. So what does Romans 12 tell us? If you're a leader, do it with diligence. Okay, here's, here's my word to you. If you're a leader, what God is saying, you need to be diligent about the task that's before you and don't lose focus about it. Keep on keeping on. Don't stop. The most successful leaders who are pastors are leaders who believe in the longevity of the pastor. Just telling you. I've been here 11 years. Started it. I'm hoping to be here another 11 years. Does that, does that make sense? And when that's done, I hope it'll be here another 11 years. So I just want you to hear me that I've, what I've discovered is that if, if God has gifted me as a leader, then I need to be diligent. I'd also say to you, if you're a leader, learn to be diligent. This is a weakness of leaders. Uh, uh, so that's the sword of the Spirit, taking dominion over the earth. All right, so let me give you the church. Revelation 3, 7 says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the keys of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. By the way, this is Jesus saying this is the one talking. He says, I want to tell you who I am. Okay, remember, Jesus is the only one. God is the only one who has all seven gifts. And he's saying to you, I'm a leader. He says, I can open things and no one can shut it because he's a leader. And I can shut things and no one can open it. Why? Because he's a leader. Do y'all see that? So verse 8 says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have a little power. By the way, let me say something about a leader. A leader is not omnipotent. But they do have a little power. He says, you have a little bit of power, and you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that, I, that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Is that a leader? <laughs> okay, listen. Again, I'm not saying that the goal should be to get people to bow at your feet. I'm saying, though, that leadership, oftentimes people will come and submit themselves to a leader. Do y'all follow that? Shake your head yes or something. Are y'all getting something out of this? Okay, just making sure. Okay, so he says, uh, I'll make them bow at your feet. Uh, 
Let's see, what verse am I at? Verse 10, because you have heard, because you've kept my word, of per, uh, my word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. By the way, remember, a leader needs diligence, right? Okay, watch and see if you see diligence in this next statement. He says, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Do you see diligence there? Don't stop doing what I've called you to do. Hold fast and keep on doing it. Diligence. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Would you say a pillar in the temple of God would be a leader? Okay. I'm going to make you a pillar, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's a leader, right? Here's number seven, mercy. Seventh item in the list, all right? Uh, okay, so what happened on day seven in creation? God rested. God rested. All right, so uh, and by, this is an interesting thing that sometimes we miss over. It's the only day of the seven that he blessed. God blessed, God, by the way, he blessed creatures, he blessed man, but it's the only day that he says, I'm blessing this day. It's a holy day to me. So God blessed the seventh day. Uh, so what does this tell us? Okay, uh, again, we're talking about mercy. So what does he say about a person who has mercy in Romans 12? He says, if you have mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Remember that? Cheerfulness. Okay, why does a person with mercy need cheerfulness? Okay, what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. A person with mercy can go to someone who sees they deserve to get kicked in the hiney. But a person with mercy will go, and they just, they just love on them. Just, they're just kind and compassionate to it. By the way, people who have to deal with a lot of people who need a lot of mercy need some cheerfulness in their life. Because over time, it can become discouraging dealing with nothing but people who keep doing the wrong thing over and over and over again. Okay, let, let me show, I'm going to say something so you catch this just a little bit, all right? So uh, I'm going to use Roy as an example over here, all right? So uh, if a person has mercy, let's say, let's say Roy keeps doing the wrong thing. He's, just, he's a bad guy, just does the wrong thing. So a person of mercy comes and gives him mercy. And then Roy, he goes away thinking, oh, Roy's going to straighten up now. And Roy goes and does the wrong thing again. So he comes back, gives him mercy again. And you know, oh, not, you know, it's okay. It's going to be all right. And you know, God forgives us. And so Roy says, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And he goes out and he does it again. Does it bad thing again. And he keeps doing bad things and he keeps getting mercy. And the person who keeps giving mercy at some point gets sick of giving mercy. They begin to lose their cheerfulness in doing what God's called them to do. And then they become a prophet. They see everything is black and white. Well, buddy, you're just going to get what you deserve now. Do y'all see this? Okay. So when he's talking about mercy here, he's saying, don't lose your cheerfulness. Don't lose your joy in what I've called you to do. Realize you're doing it for the Lord and not for them anyway. So sometimes we think we're doing it for the person. We're not. We're doing it for the Lord. Mercy. Uh, so what is the item in the armor of God that the person needs to help them to be able to be a cheerful, merciful person? What's the last thing? Prayer. Think about this. Most people miss this. They think you finish with the sword and it's all over. I love how the NIV translates this because I think, you know, every translation has its issues because it's a translation. It's not original text. But I actually think NIV does the best of this. NIV says, and, after the sword of the Spirit, he says, and Pray. Okay, let me, let me just read this for you. Let me read it like this. Here's how you're to pray. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Five times he says pray. Pray, 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 pray. And here's what he's saying is, if you got mercy, you need to pray. That you don't lose your cheerfulness and joy in giving mercy to people. Y'all see that? Okay, so what church goes along with this? I'm going to do this quick. Revelation 3, 14, the last church, it's the church of Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. And by the way, I think he's telling us that the beginning of creation, because he's saying, you know, by the way, if there was a beginning, there was an end. And what did he do at the end? He rested. Okay, I'll, that'll become even more clear in a moment. 
But just watch, just keep, in, keep that in mind. So watch this, verse 15. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. By the way, this is a misinterpretation today. We, ha the, we have this interpretation that what God is saying is, I wish you were on fire for me or not on fire at all. That's a bad interpretation. Okay, let me, let me tell you why, okay? Uh, hot water is useful water. Can we agree with that? Okay, can you cook with hot water? Is it useful? Yes. Okay, cold water is useful water. Listen, when you need your thirst quenched, do you want to drink a gallon of hot water? No, you want cold water. Why? Because cold water is useful. You know what's not useful? Lukewarm water. You know what tastes bad? Stagnant water. Okay, here's what God's saying. I wish you were useful one way or the other. Either able that I could use you to cook with or I could use you to refresh, but I wish you were hot or cold, not lukewarm. So verse 16 says, so because you, have, you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay, here's what God is saying. I hope you catch this. You think that you've arrived. You think that you don't need me. But what did they need? Okay, I hope you catch this. You know what they needed? Mercy. By, by the way, the things that they needed, they couldn't get. Because they couldn't afford them. Okay, so here's what God says in the next verse. I advise you to buy from me. God says, I want you to come and buy something from me. Gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich. And white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves. And, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And the eye salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Okay, they couldn't get those on their own. God says, I, I advise you to buy from me. By the way, you know how much it costs to buy these things from the Lord? Is that a spiritual term? Okay. <laughs> Zero. Nada. It's free. Okay, that's mercy. You deserve eternal judgment from me. You deserve me to puke you up. That's what God is saying. But come to me, buy from me something that's free. That's mercy. Y'all see that? So he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He's saying, I'm right here. Well, how do I get it? God says, I'm right here. I'm at the door of your heart knocking. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. Watch this. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me. How did he start this? I want to remind you, I'm the one that started all this creation thing. How did he end it? And I want to invite you to sit down with me. What happened? What, what happened on day seven? God sat down and said, it's good. And here's what he's saying to the person with mercy. I want to invite you. All, by, the way, here's, by the way, a mercy person is a very diligent person. They're helping this person with mercy and helping this person with mercy and helping this person. And there's a flurry of activity around the mercy person. And what God's saying is, you need to sit down with me. Martha, Martha. Are y'all seeing this? Is that good? Amen. Sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame, I worked hard, and I sat down with my father on his throne. And if you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is that good? Okay, here's, I want you to say, I want to say this to you. Every one of you has one of these seven. Every one of you. And God wants you to know what your gift is. Now, here's what's important. If you don't know what your gift is, and you don't know how God has gifted you, how can you redeem what you don't know you have? How can you say, Lord, I have something, and you don't know what it is? So I'm saying to you, it's important to know what gift God placed within you so that you can take it to God and say, hey, Lord, I just discovered I'm a leader. Lord, would you redeem my leadership? Uh, you find out you're a steward. God, thank you that you've made me a steward. Help me not to become that greedy person. Lord, help me to give with generosity and liberality. Lord, I give it back to you that you might use it. I choose to walk with you. Does that, does that make sense? We all need to know what it is. So this is, this is our, here's your homework assignment for this week. Okay, wouldn't it be great if next week 100% of us come back with our homework assignment done? I'm going to make it so easy any of you can do it, okay? Here's your homework assignment. I want you to every day this week pray, Lord, would you help me to know what my gifting is? Every day. 
Lord, today, would you just reveal to me, help me to see it in my actions today, what my gift is, okay? Now, here's what's going to happen next week. It's very important. Next week, when you come in, I want you to sit with your friends and family. Did you hear me? Here's why. Next week, I'm going to do something I have never done before. I may never do it ever again, okay? This may totally flop and totally fail, but we're going to try it. I'm going to give you a sheet, a list of, of all seven gifts next week, and I'm going to show you every weakness and every strength. Well, I don't, every is a big term. I'm going to give you a lot of strengths and a lot of weaknesses of each gift. I'm going to show you what a mature, mature believer looks like with this gift, and I'm going to show you what an immature believer looks like with these gifts. And we're going to sit with our friends and family and by the way, your friends and family oftentimes can see what you are more than you can. Someone says, why? Here, why is that true? Because here's what we tend to do. We tend to look at all the negatives, and we don't like those negatives, so we want to see something else in ourselves, so we, want, we see what we wish we were, and then we, we say, that's what, what, what I am. But our friends and family oftentimes can look and go, no, that's not what you are. This is what you are, because you remember this time? You remember that time? You remember when you did this? That's what this guy would do. Okay, does that make sense? So it'll help you. We're going to walk this out next week, and I'm hoping when we're done next week, not only will you discover your purpose, but you'll have an opportunity to, 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 to deliver your purpose to God and that we might go back and deploy the gifting God's placed within us and become the Christian God's called us to be. Is that pretty good? Y'all ready for that next week? Okay, let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for every believer who's in this room today. And uh, Father, I pray that you'll just take your word and that you'll plant it deep within our hearts. And, and I pray this week that the enemy will not come and rob us of this incredible seed that's placed within us. And so, Lord, uh, I just, I just pray, a, a pray for protection over my brothers and sisters who are in this room today. I pray, God, that the enemy will not uh, detour us from the thought, I need to know what my purpose is. And I'm and asking you today, Father, would you reveal your purpose in us, your plans in us, our, our gifting that you've given us. So, Father, thank you for this. Thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name.